So before we get into today's study, uh, I want to highlight something briefly. Uh, every Sunday after service, um, I take a video recording of our service and I post it to YouTube. And so, if you go to YouTube, you can do a search for either Pastor Tom Broadbent or for Calvary Chapel Aspen Trail, and the videos will pop up and will generate, and you can watch them. And a lot of times, uh, when I upload these videos, I'll go back and I'll watch them. And I watch them because uh, I want to make sure that what I'm speaking is truth, <laughs> and that if I have to make a correction, that I do. Uh, because what's most important is that, that I'm speaking truth to you guys. Well, last week uh, there was a misspoke. Uh, uh, as I was talking about my testimony, if you remember from last week, we were talking about alcohol, right? And in, the, in my sermon, I had mentioned that my wife and I were the only Christians in our family. And that's not entirely accurate. Uh, that... Uh, uh, at that time, back in 2009, there were not a lot of Christians in my family, but the very few that we have, you know, the, some of them are brand new, some of them are immature in their walk. You know, everybody's at a different place in their walk. And so it really kind of was a disservice for me to say that my wife and I were the only Christians, because that's certainly not the, the, the case. And, uh, and so, uh, but we all have family that, that are not Christians. And the point being made last week was that I want to make sure to guard my testimony, especially to those that are not saved in my family. And so I just wanted to clarify that. Um, you know, my I've seen some tremendous growth, re growth recently with my mother. Uh, she's starting to do devotions uh, more consistently, uh, which is fantastic. Uh, my stepmother, I see some growth in her. Uh, my Aunt Dee Dee, for example, uh, she's coming out here in November. She texted me out of the blue, and she says, Tom, I want you to baptize me. <laughs> and I'm like, okay. <laughs> so she'll be out here in November, and you'll get the pleasure to meet her. In fact, we'll do a baptism right here at Aspen Trail. And uh, if there's anybody here that wants to get baptized, come talk to me at some other time, and, and we'll plan for that. But anyhow, and so I just wanted to be clear, there are some people in my family that are saved, and praise God for that, but there are some that are not, and we need to do all we can to protect our testimony. Amen? Amen. So, this week, uh, we're going to continue our study in John chapter 2, and uh, we're going to pick up in verse 13. Uh, my encouragement to you, if you have your Bibles, open your Bibles to John chapter 2. Uh, we'll be in verses 13 to 25, so we'll finish out the chapter today prayerfully. And, uh, and so, uh, and as we go through the, the chapter, uh, what I'd like us to do is, I'm going to go through and I'm going to read the text. And as I read the text, I will highlight a few things as we go along. But then I want us to have a discussion, if you will. And so for all you folks out there that are a little shy, a little, uh, you know, uh, timid, don't like to speak up, listen, we are a family, amen? We're brothers and sisters in Christ, right? And so as a family, we should have the freedom to speak freely, amen? And so I want us to have a discussion, but what I want to do is I want us to try and figure out, uh, as we look at the text, the overarching theme of the text and the underlying principles. Now, understanding that the overarching theme speaks to the interpretation of the text. It speaks to the interpretation of the text. What was being said by the original author to the original hearers of the word? The underlying principles speaks to application. Now, when we think about the overarching theme or the interpretation of the text, understand that there's only one true interpretation of the text. If you and I read a portion of Scripture and we come up with two different interpretations, 
then there's only three possibilities. You're right and I'm wrong. I'm right and you're wrong. Or we're both wrong. Because we both can't be right if we have different interpretations. Only one true interpretation. But then you might say, wait a minute, Tom. I, you know, there's times when I'll read a portion of text and it speaks to my heart in a particular way. And then a week or two later, I can go back and read that same text and all of a sudden it, it kind of means something different to me. Who's experienced that? Right? So you know what I'm talking about. Well, that gets into application. Application. And see, and this is why the, the scriptures are, are alive. And it's, it's a living word of God that applies not just to the early church, but to the modern church. To you and to me today. Because as we read the scriptures, the truth of God's word comes alive and we figure out how to apply it to our lives. Amen? And so as we, so just to clarify, just to clarify, we have overarching themes, underlying principles, interpretation versus application. What was being said versus how do we apply that truth to our lives today? Whenever we read the scriptures, that's what we need to be thinking about. As we read through the text, we need to be asking ourselves, what's the overarching theme? What's the interpretation? What's being said? But then what's the underlying principles? What's the application? How do I apply the truth to my life right now, today? And understand that there's oftentimes more than one underlying principle in the scriptures. And we'll see that today. So, let's go to the text. John chapter 2. Picking up in verse 13. And this is where Christ, Jesus Christ, is just before Passover. I'm going to kind of set the stage a little bit. It's just before Passover. He's been trying to get to Jerusalem for Passover. He finally gets here. Uh, it's not quite Passover yet. It's the week leading up to Passover. And he goes into his father's house. And lo and behold, what does he see? He sees his father's house turned into a marketplace. So let's read the text. Verse 13. Now the Passover of the Jews was at hand. And Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And he found in the temple those who sold oxen and sheep and doves and the money changers doing business. Now, pause right there for a moment just to, to bring some context. Who remembers what Passover is all about? Who can share? What is Passover? Right, so during the Exodus, right, uh, when the Jews were going to leave Egypt, right, uh, they were trying to talk Pharaoh into letting the people, you know, let my people go, right? You remember that. <laughs> Anyways, so uh, one of the plagues was the death of the firstborn. And so to advert having your child killed, uh, they were to uh, put hyssop, and uh, over their, their doorpost, and when they saw the blood, it was blood and hyssop, when they saw that on the doorpost, the angel of the Lord would pass over, which is where we get the term Passover, would pass over that house, sparing that child, right? And so it's all about, really, a sacrificial lamb and the spilling of blood to protect people from death, right? And so, uh, in once that began to develop, that theme of a sacrificial lamb began to develop, people of Israel were commanded that they needed to uh, sacrifice uh, the lamb or a goat, uh, in some cases birds, uh, to atone for their sins. 
This is what was to be done. But a lot of people were poor. And, or a lot of people didn't want to hassle taking something from, from their, their, their stock and, and transporting it all the way to Jerusalem during the time of the sacrifice to sacrifice their lambs or their sheep or whatever. And so oftentimes these merchants would, would show up and they would sell lambs and sheep and birds for the purposes of the sacrifice. And so it really kind of goes against what God originally instituted, right? And so this is what's happening. Uh, you know, verse 15, when he had made a whip of, uh, of cords, he drove them all out of the temple uh, with the sheep and the oxen and poured out the chain, uh, the uh, changer's money and overturned the tables. And he said to those who sold doves, Take these things away. And he says, Do not make my father's house a, a house of merchandise. Verse 17. Then his disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house. And he's quoting out of the Psalms, Psalm 69. Zeal for your house has eaten thee up. So the Jews answered and said to him, What sign do you show us since you do these things? And Jesus, Jesus answered and said to them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will uh, rise it uh, rise it up. Or excuse me, raise it up. Verse twenty. Then the Jews said, "It has taken forty six years to build this temple, and you're going to raise it up in three days." But he was speaking of the temple of his body. Therefore, when he had risen from the dead, his disciples remembered. He had said this to them, and they believed the scriptures and the word which Jesus had said. Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, many believed in his name. And when they saw the signs which he did, but Jesus did not commit himself to them because he knew all men. And he had no need of anyone to testify of man, for he knew what was in man. And so, uh, again, what's happening is, you know, Jesus is going up to Jerusalem for the Passover. He goes into his father's house, the temple. They, they, tamed, they, they turned it into a marketplace. They're selling sheep and, and lambs and doves. And, and the Bible says in verse 15 uh, that Jesus sat down and made a whip of cords. Now, this whip of cords that Jesus made was actually what's called the cat of nine tails. And so it was a whip that had, it would branch out into several strands of cords that were woven together. And as these cords were woven together, shards of metal and glass and, and things like this was woven into these cords. And this is what was used by Jesus. Now, you think about this for a second. Now, I'm not, I've never made a whip. I've never made a cat of nine tails. Uh, but I have a little bit of an imagination. And, and likewise, I've never been a, a beautician doing hair. I don't even have hair, hardly. But, you know, I, I, that's not what I do, right? But I have an imagination. And maybe for some of the women in the room, they could probably speak more intelligently than I, but it takes a while to braid somebody's hair. That the whole braiding thing, right? It takes some time. Likewise, it takes some time to braid uh, the cords, of cat of nine tails, and not only to braid these things, these cords together, but to to braid into it shards of metal, right? And so Jesus is taking his time. He shows up. Think for. Just imagine for you with yourself for a moment, if you will. Jesus comes into the temple. He sees everything. He doesn't do anything immediately. What he does is he goes off, sits down, and he starts braiding these cords together. This takes time. And yet this is what Jesus does. Then once he makes this cat of nine tails, this cord, if you will, this whip, he comes in and he starts turning over tables, turning over the, 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 the cash box. He's, he's yielding this whip, 
and he's chasing everybody out of the temple. So, this is, this is what's going on. Understanding all of that, what's the overarching theme of this text? What do you think? Not a rhetorical question. I'm going to wait for a response. The church is to be used for worshiping God, not a story. Okay, the church is, the temple is supposed to be used for God. Okay, very good. Anybody else? What do you think? Okay, I caught part of that. You were talking about it yesterday. Uh, Jesus is ultimately going to be the ultimate sacrifice, right? Uh, and we see this in the latter part of the, the text. What specifically about his anger? Because maybe I, I don't have my hearing aids on, but so maybe I'm missing something. Can, can, you, can you clarify? Okay. Oh, okay, so he was angry about it. All right. Anybody else? Think for a second, if you will, who's writing this message? Remember, the overarching theme is about understanding what the original author is communicating to the original hearer. What's the, who's the author here? John, right? And what was John's purpose in writing his gospel? To highlight what? Love. Okay, what else? That Jesus, in fact, was the creator. That John, what John wanted to do is highlight the fact that Jesus is God. Highlighting his deity, right? We, we learned that in chapter 1. Right? And so he does that all throughout the gospel. He's always looking to highlight Jesus' deity, the fact that he is God. And so we see that in this text, in that uh, he shows Jesus' passion for reverence, for reverence, and that God alone exercised the right. To regulate his worship. Remember, it was God that said, You need to look in, in your own herd, look at your own herd, your own sheep, your own flock, and you need to pick one that's without blemish. That was the requirement. And they changed the requirement, they changed what God had stipulated. By saying, you know what, don't worry about what God said. Just go ahead and make the journey here to the temple, and we'll be set up here in the temple, and we'll tell you what you need. Really? Is that what God wanted? It's really not a sacrifice. That's right. And so only God has the right to regulate how worship should take place, especially in this house. Amen. And that, and that there needs to be a reverence. Amen? We can't, we can't take what God did for us lightly. You certainly don't disrespect God, especially in His house. Amen? So this is kind of the overarching thing. This is what John is trying to communicate to the hearers of the Word. He's saying, listen, God is Jesus is God. It's his right to regulate worship how he so desires, and we need to respect that. That's the message. Right? That's what we see. So let's now talk a little bit about the underlying principles. How do we apply that to our lives? 
What stands out to you? How does this text, this portion of text, speak to your heart? We have to sacrifice something of our own. Okay. What else? There's no right or wrong answer here, folks. What's God speaking to your heart about when you read this text? We've got to respect the temple or the church, the house of God. Right? Let's talk about respecting the temple for a moment. This is not in my notes, but it just came to me when you said this. And so I got a little bit excited. <laughs> the latter part of our text, Jesus makes an argument. Tear this temple down, and in three days I'm going to rebuild it. I'll raise it up again, right? He didn't say rebuild, he said, I'm going to raise it up again, right? And we know from the text that he wasn't talking about the building. He was talking about himself. His body being the temple. You remember, uh, maybe uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, we I went off on one of these little bunny trails about the temple of God. And where did I tell you guys, when we accept the Lord in our lives, what happens to us? We become the temple of the living God, right? And so when you talk about not disrespecting the temple or honoring the temple... This is, it goes to application, the underlying principle, respect the temple, and then we could surmise that we need to then respect the body. Right? Show reverence for the body. This is where we get the idea of modesty. Right? Just saying. Right? But, let's go on. I think what, one of the things I see anyway, uh, and we'll discuss a couple of them, one of the things I see is that although, although that God desires an intimate, personal relationship with us, in that, he allows us to call him Abba, which means father, daddy, right? It's a parent-child relationship, very intimate, very close. God desires that. He wants to call us his children, right? Even though we have that liberty in the relationship to call him Abba, there still needs to be a healthy respect, right? Or some people might refer to it as a healthy fear, right? Romans 8.15 uh, Paul says, For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you receive the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. So again, highlighting the fact that Jesus, or God, desires, the Father desires that intimate relationship with him. But we cannot take that, that love relationship for granted. We cannot treat that relationship with kind of a haphazardly or flippant attitude. You think about your relationship with your, your own parents. If they told you to do something, what did you do? You did it, right? Why? Because he said so. Plain and simple. Period. No, there's no room for discussion. You just did it, right? I'm curious with you. You're the youngest one in the room. When your parents ask you to do something, perhaps maybe something you didn't agree with, what was that discussion like? Yeah, it makes sense. So, so you're highlighting the fact that the Bible says, children, obey your parents and the Lord, 
for this is the first commandment with a promise, right? We've got to honor our mother and fathers. And so you're doing it. Sometimes you do things that you don't agree with. You do it reluctantly because you know your parents got your best interest at heart. And, and you know, whether you agree with it or not, you're just going to do it, right? What happens if you don't do it? You get in trouble, right? So it goes back to a principle I taught my kids uh, often throughout their time growing up. You do the right thing, God will bless you. If you don't, you suffer the consequences. Yesterday morning in our men's breakfast, uh, we started talking about uh, uh, one of the uh, guys in our our group, uh, still kind of a young Christian, um, decided to allow his girlfriend to move in with him. And oh, what a mistake that was, right? And, And so I looked at him, I said, brother, I said, if you know to do right and don't do it, what does the Bible call that? Sin, right? And so if you do the wrong thing, how do you expect God to bless? Just saying. Not judging you, I'm just making a truth statement. Right? Speaking Bible, right? And so we can't take these this relationship with our God uh, in a very haphazard, flippant sort of way. We've got to understand that, yes, even though he grants us uh, the ability to refer to him as Abba Father, he's still God. He's still the creator of this universe. Right? And so we need to re- re- remember that. He's still your daddy, right? You need to remember that. I remember when I was a kid, my dad said something. If there was even a hint, a hint of, uh, of dissension, he had this look that when you got the look, you knew, oh, man, I'm in trouble. <laughs> I better do it right, like right now, <laughs> right? Whose daddy out there had a look like that? Growing up, yeah? we. I think we all... all I, you know, if you ask my kids, I probably have to look too. I don't know. Maybe it's one of those instinctual things that dads get when they become dads. I don't know. But when God speaks, we need to listen. My daddy used to always tell me, he said, boy, I brought you into this world, I'll take you out. I think, you know what? The, reality, the truth statement is God brought us into this world. He could take us out. Amen. There's another underlying principle that is a little bit more obscure, but I want to highlight it because I think it's important. If you remember in first, or excuse me, in Genesis chapter one, verse twenty-six, God said, "Let us make man in our image, in our likeness." You remember that? Paul kind of reiterates that theme in in Romans chapter 8. He says, uh, in verse 29, he says, For whom he, God, foreknew, he also predestined to be, get this, conformed to the image of his Son. Marinate on that for a second. Or should I say, Salah. So the reality is what Paul is trying to teach us in Romans 8.29 is that the goal of God's predestined purpose for his children, for his own, is that we would be made in the likeness of Christ. And he continues to reiterate that in the book of Ephesians. You remember Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 and 2 says, uh, Therefore be imitators of, of Christ. Be imitators of God. Why? He wants us to walk in love as Christ also had loved us and given himself for us. We talked about that during communion as an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. Amen? 
And so what does it really mean? We're almost out of time. What does it really mean? That'd be interesting on the video. <laughs> what does it really mean to be made in God's image or in his likeness? What's that? One more time. Oh, it's a good question. Okay. <laughs> I thought you had an answer. It's a, it's a statement. Okay. So the reality is when God created us in his own image, in his likeness, he created us like himself, body, mind, and spirit. Body, mind, and spirit. So we look like him physically. We have the ability to think like him and to speak like him. But as equally important, we have the, the ability to take on ourselves much of his attributes, his character. And so when it says be imitators of God, it's to imitate his attributes, his character. There's a book out there by Arthur Pink that talks uh, a lot about the attributes of God. And I'm just going to highlight a few of the chapters, just the titles of the chapters, to kind of get my point across. Think about this for a second. And he titles these chapters based off a particular attribute. The faithfulness of God. The goodness of God. The patience of God. The grace of God. The mercy of God. The love of God. And yes, the wrath of God. So if we're to be imitators of God, he expects us to be faithful, to be good, patient, full of grace, full of mercy, full of love, and at times full of wrath. If you remember our time from last week, I, I kind of quoted the uh, passage from Ecclesiastes. In fact, chapter 3 highlights is there time and a place for everything. So when you look at the underlying principle that we see here in John chapter 2, where Jesus gets angry, what does the scripture say about anger? Be angry and sin not. So that in itself tells us it's okay to get angry at times. In fact, we probably should at times. Colorado just passed a piece of legislation making it perfectly legal for abortions. That should anger us. But it should be a righteous anger. God got angry. In fact, he took the time to, to, to allow his anger to brew while he fashioned this whip, the cat of nine tails. And then he began to wield it in the temple. It's okay to get angry at times. But don't let the anger turn to sin. When we think about being made in Christ's likeness, in God's image, body, mind, and soul, that includes the ability to be faithful, the ability to be good, the ability to show grace and mercy and forgiveness and love. It includes all of that. And it includes the ability to get angry at times. And that's okay. But if we're going to be faithful, we need to make sure that we're not sinning in that faithfulness. When we get angry, do not sin. When we love, do not sin. Wait a minute, how are you going to sin when you love? Well, we call that lust, right? Fornication. Adultery. It's a perversion of love. Twisting what God made to be good, and twisting it to be perverse. That's what Satan wants. So when we love, do not sin. When we're, and I said, when we're faithful, do not sin. Any of these attributes listed in the scriptures 
You can add the words to it and do not sin. Fill in the blank. I can't imagine what must have been going through the Lord's mind at this time. To walk into his father's house essentially his house. He's God. And to see how mankind has twisted it. What he designed to be good and perfect. A place that he designed to be a center of worship. These guys perverted. They were, they were looking out for self. Oh, how can we take this and, and, and make money from it? Really? Really? Father God, we thank you for your word this morning. We thank you that, that you've given us an example of what righteous anger looks like. But our prayer for ourselves is that we are able to imitate you in all areas of our life. That we, when we get angry, that it is a righteous anger. And that we're not puffed up with pride. That when we love, it's a pure love, unconditional love, that is not perverted by lust or perversion. That when we are faithful, that it be genuine. That it would be a faith that could say to a mountain, be moved into the sea, and it would be moved. That it would be a faith that when we say, Lord, just speak it, and I know it to be so. Just like the centurion did when his child was sick. Help us to live that type of life that would please you, Lord. That when we stand before you, your, your response to us is, well done, good and faithful servant. We love you. We want to honor you. We want to give you glory. In Jesus' name, by the power of your spirit, amen. The closing song today is How Great Thou Art.